All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on inclusive youth apprenticeship. Today's webinar is one in a, a series of events for the Apprenticeship Inclusion Models or AIM community of practice. I'll be getting more into the specifics of our webinar shortly, but first I just wanted to welcome everybody and go over a few housekeeping items. All right, so the first thing I wanted to mention was personalized captions. As you can see, we have live captioning running just below the slide deck. Uh, but if you would like to personalize that, the link to the captioning uh, web page is posted in the chat. And if you go there, you can personalize those options. Uh, you can change the font and the color and the size. So if that's something you'd like to do, uh, feel free to click on that uh, caption link. The next thing I wanted to alert you to is uh, questions. So we will definitely be taking questions at the end of this webinar. Um, if you think of anything while our presenters are uh, presenting, please put those questions into the Q&A box specifically. Um, that just makes it easier for our hosts to see them and to assign those to our presenters today. If you put your questions into the chat, we'll try to catch them, but they're harder to see often. So uh, questions into the Q&A box. And then lastly, if you need technical support or if you're having some issues with the platform, uh, you can open the participants list, which is um, you can get to by clicking on the icon of a person uh, and select the raise hand button next to your name. And somebody from our team will be in touch with you and uh, hopefully help you resolve your issues. So we have a very exciting webinar today on youth, modern youth apprenticeship and how to make it more inclusive. Um, we'll start with some welcome and introductions and then we'll go over a quick uh, overview of AIM um, and talk a little bit about um, some of our upcoming events. Uh, then my colleague Vince Kohler is going to give us a little bit of context to what uh, inclusive apprenticeship and specifically what inclusive youth apprenticeship um, can mean for the country will he'll be followed up by Brent Parton from New America, who's going to give us an overview of some of the latest happenings uh, in modern youth apprenticeship around the country. And then uh, lastly, we are so lucky we have Debbie Hopkins with us from the Shenandoah Workforce Development Board, and she's going to be talking about an inclusive youth apprenticeship program that they're running in Virginia. We'll wrap things up with some Q&A, and then I'll have a few announcements about some upcoming AIM events. I just realized that the, um, I'm just going to fix the size of our captioning, because I realize that is not big enough, and I apologize. There we go. We'll make this a little bit more available to everyone. Oops. All right, there we go. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, I apologize for that, everybody. Here we go. So, aim. So today, as I mentioned, we have uh, Vince Kohler. He is the project director for the Apprenticeship Inclusions Models. Uh, or, <clears throat> my name is Jesse Ettinger. I did not introduce myself earlier, but I am the co-project manager for AIM. And then, as mentioned, we have uh, two great presenters today, Brent Parton from New America and Debbie Hopkins from the Shenandoah Workforce Development Board. So just to get us started, I wanted to talk a little bit about what AIM is. Uh, first of all, it is uh, sponsored by the USDOL Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP. The focus is to expand access um, to occupational skills training, credential attainment, and job placement and retention, specifically through apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship models. Oops. <clears throat> so our goal with AIM is to learn as much as possible about how apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship um, is both currently being used to serve people with disabilities and also how it can be adapted. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by supporting, researching, and evaluating innovative apprenticeship pilot models in high growth in demand industry sectors such as IT, healthcare, and advanced manufacturing. Um, and, and what I really want to focus on today and just thinking about an overview of what AIM is, is that the idea is to build apprenticeship pathways that target youth and adults with disabilities into high-paying, well-demand careers. 
And apprenticeship is exciting to us for a number of reasons. Um, one of the most uh, sort of obvious ways in terms of thinking specifically about youth and adults with disabilities is apprenticeship is the gold standard of work-based learning and earn and learn. Um, and it's competitive integrated employment from day one. You're in the workplace, you're earning a wage. So that's really exciting um, to us. And then I think the other really exciting opportunity that we see right now and that we're having right now um, is really with apprenticeship more generally. It's, um, it's an exciting time in this country. There are so many new apprenticeship programs. There's so much investment and interest and energy at the federal, state, and local level. And one of the things that I find most heartening and exciting about this dialogue is that when we talk about apprenticeship now, um, we're being very specific in saying, how can we make this opportunity of, the, of apprenticeship accessible to populations of people who maybe have not traditionally been included in apprenticeship? And so there are obviously lots of really terrific initiatives happening all over the country to engage youth and other kinds of populations. And where I see AIM's role in all of this is that um, we are definitely here to contribute to that conversation and to very specifically uh, talk about how all of this new apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship work can also be uh, inclusive of people with disabilities. And we like to say, you know, apprenticeship is built for everyone and that's really where we're going with this. So um, that is all I am gonna say today. I'm very excited to turn things over to my colleague, Vince Kohler, and he is going to get us into uh, the meat of this conversation today, which is really about inclusive youth apprenticeship. So Vince, I'm handing things right over to you. Thanks, Jesse, uh, it's, and hello, everyone. It's great to see so many of you virtually on this topic that's near and dear to my heart, um, making apprenticeship accessible to everyone. And today, as Jesse mentioned, we're focusing on youth. Um, why youth and why now is sort of the first uh, topic I wanna raise. Um, you've probably heard the statistic before that in the US, the average age of an apprentice is around 28 to 29 years. In most other countries that use apprenticeship widely, the average age is around 17 to 18 years of age. Uh, we don't have to time to today to go into the whole history of why the US is an, a bit of an outlier in this respect. But I would like to at least articulate why bringing down that average age by focusing on high school age apprentices in particular has many advantages for youth, uh, for educators and for businesses and for the communities uh, that they all live in. I'll be brief. I know that our speakers have much more to say on this. I don't want to steal their thunder, but again, for context, I think this matters and it matters now, especially. For young people, it seems obvious, but it's worth repeating here that clearly young people uh, need on ramps into the world of work. I'll point out in a minute how our current approach is not serving them that well, at least not all youth. Um, educators like work based learning, and you've heard this before, uh, because it increases the motivation of students, it allows educators to focus on what they're good at, um, and it keeps the guesswork out of trying to predict the future. Um, you know, you often hear the, you know, what skills will be needed in a few, a few years from now. Um, very hard to do, very hard to do for educators. Uh, if you move that part of the education into the workplace, then it's not so difficult. It just happens. And businesses benefit in all sorts of ways. Constant influx of young people with new ideas, including and especially digital natives, uh, can be a huge asset to a company. Of course, communities and economies as a whole are made more resilient by youth apprenticeship being widely available. And with, there's stats, there's research to support this. Uh, and this is important, especially at a time of a, of a recession. Uh, so let me describe the three uh, factors or three of the factors a little more uh, in, in a little more detail because I think they're particularly relevant. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> So this graphic here shows how the need for experience and for post-secondary education as a prerequisite has gone up while the opportunity for employment with only minimal education has gone down. So I'll just explain it briefly here. The rapidly descending line on this graph, if you can see it, um, uh, 
going from about 90% in the 50s to less than 10% in the mid 2010s shows how you can no longer get a job with just a secondary education. So almost 90% of people could do that in the 50s, fewer than 10% can do that today. The relatively steep, steeply rising lines uh, show how requirements for soft skills, for work experience, and for post-secondary education have been on the rise during those same during that same time. Obviously, it's kind of correspond. It makes sense that post-secondary education requirements go up as minimal education requirements go down. But what may not be so obvious is that soft requirement for soft skills. And requirement for um, work experience in particular has gone up at the same time. So, again, you used to be able to get a job without work experience. Very hard to do today. So, all of this has implications for how we prepare people. So, let me add another factor to this mix. Um, next slide, please. You've often heard about the so called skills gap. But there's also something called a degree gap. It's a term coined by Professor Joseph Fuller at the Harvard Business School, whose stats I'm using here. And this uh, one reason why access to job has gotten more difficult for those who don't have a degree, even in areas where degrees were not required in the past. So the degree gap talks about the difference between workers who are already employed in the occupation who actually have a degree on the right, uh, in, in this particular case, supervisor of production workers, that's 16% at a given moment in time. And the number of uh, the job postings and the requirements in those job postings on the left, 67% uh, of job postings for the same position now require a degree. Again, current workers don't have a degree, Future workers, or at least uh, uh, the desired pool of future workers, require a degree. That is an enormous gap. It's more than 50% increase in the degree requirement. And that poses particular challenges, especially for those who are not on the degree tag just now. Let's look at one more. Well, let's look at how we're doing in getting people <laughs> to degrees, right? Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, given this degree gap, you'd think that all we have to do is send everyone to college and everything will be fine. And in fact, in a way, that's been the mantra for the last 30 years. Uh, and here's how we're doing. It turns out this, this data is now about a decade old. It hasn't changed that much. Um, for every 100 ninth graders, about 74 uh, graduate on time, 45 or 46 start college by age 24, 30 stay enrolled a year after, 22 earn a degree within six years, and 12 earn a four-year degree. So if we are trying to measure it by sending everyone to college, we're not doing great. There's There are other venues that we have to explore. So let's look at one more factor to throw it in the mix. I don't want to paint too gloomy a, a picture, but it is worth looking at the reality that we're faced with. So next slide, please. All of this has resulted in the growth of one group of youth, those disconnected from education and from the workforce, also called opportunity youth. The Measure of America project of the Social Science Research Council has done some really important work on this and has just come out with a new report on opportunity youth. And what this new report suggests is that at a time when we've actually made some progress in getting youth reconnected to the workforce, those that had been disconnected, uh, those numbers have been in decline, meaning we have had fewer people who are disconnected. Those are individuals 16 through 24 who are neither in education nor in the, in the workforce. Um, we are at risk right now to have all of that undone by um, in part by the current recession, uh, un youth unemployment is already at 25%. And there is this risk that through the COVID uh, recession that the those opportunity youth uh, groups could grow to uh, almost a quarter of all youth. So that's kind of the backdrop. Now, 
knowing all of this, how do we best gain work experience and employability skills? Let's go to the next slide. The answer is obvious to all of you because that's what you're working on. We're working on apprenticeship. We think that the skills gained, uh, work experience in particular, and employability skills, of course, is in the workplace. And so that's the context that we're seeing ourselves in. And there's some very good news on this score. We have opportunities out there, uh, new models, both uh, somewhat influenced from abroad, from uh, countries that have done this for longer, but there are many models here in the US um, that are making some significant progress in getting youth into these work-based learning opportunities and making youth apprenticeship a, a reality here. And that I think is a good segue for me to hand it off to my dear friend, Brent Parton, New America. Um, Actually, to... I'm sorry, Vince. Oh, sorry. Actually, okay. um, before we transition uh, yes. to Brent, um, I just got a message that Jennifer Sheehy from ODEP is on the line, and oh, we wanted to uh, have her say a couple words and uh, welcome her uh, assistant, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Jennifer Sheehy. We are so excited to have you on our webinar. And um, let's see, Melissa, can you find her and? Give her, uh, unmute her, please. Already done. Thank you. All right, Jennifer, over to you. You know what, I think maybe we're having some audio issues. So um, we'll continue to back chat on this one and um, I'm gonna transition things back to Brent and then hopefully at the end of Debbie's um, presentation, we'll have a, an opportunity to hear from Jennifer. Um, and again, we're really excited to have you with us and Brent, I'm sorry to have preempted you, but uh, we'll, we'll get back over to you now. That's quite all right, Jesse. Um, thank you, Vin. Thank you, SPRA team, for teeing up what is a very really sensitive webinar on a very important topic. Uh, again, my name is Brent Parton. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center in Education and Skills at New America. So if you go to the next slide, please. I'll share just very quickly what New America is. We are a nonpartisan research organization. We are based in Washington, D.C. We focus on a range of different issues that we do research and public policy efforts around, but education policy is one of our main areas and where I sit specifically is called the Center in Education and Skills. Uh, why that's important to know for the purposes of this conversation, uh, it builds a lot off of what Vince has shared. Outside of the United States, apprenticeship is really a strategy that is deeply integrated within education and workforce systems, particularly education at the K-12 and post-secondary level. It's an integrated career pathway. In the United States, by comparison, the ship tends to kind of typically through the registered system has somewhat operated on its own and tended to serve folks that were older in age, as Vin shared. So one of the key questions we are interested in at our organization and with our partners is how do we better make apprenticeship a mainstream option for our youth and our young people, but also better integrating it with our workforce system, with our vocational rehabilitation system. So it's really a mainstream practice for how we connect people to good jobs. Next slide, please. As part of our national research and efforts, we lead a number of different initiatives, but by far one of our largest and most complicated ones called the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. Otherwise, I'll refer to it as PIA. PIA is a multi-year initiative that supports efforts in states and cities to expand access to high quality apprenticeship opportunities for high school age youth. Vin's already laid out in detail why it's important to be thinking about apprenticeship as a transition strategy for helping young people go leave the high school and transition into the workplace and into the post-secondary education space. For, for now, going on years, the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship has supported these states and cities across the country. We operate a network of about 45 different sites. We've provided grants to nine of them, 
And generally, we provide technical assistance, exchange of best practices, and try to increase knowledge and understanding of how these youth apprenticeship pathways look in the United States. So what I want to do for just a few minutes today is give you a little bit of a brief readout on how we're thinking about youth apprenticeship and what we're seeing in different parts of the country for this as a strategy. Next slide, please. The partnership for, is it first to define what we mean by youth apprenticeship, because in the United States, there technically is no single federal national definition for youth apprenticeship. Uh, youth apprenticeship programs rather may be codified at a state level, but are generally a norm of practice. So the partnership to advance youth apprenticeship going on for about two years ago, the broad coalition of partners we work with that include groups like the National Governors Association, JFF, Advanced CTE, all came together and tried to look at the landscape of existing youth apprenticeship programs in the United States and come up with a normative definition, not just for what those programs look like, but also what are the principles by which this field needs to be advancing? Next slide, please. Say youth apprenticeship. We are certainly talking about an apprenticeship program. My understanding is you all have been working on and are connected with various apprenticeship initiatives and know that any apprenticeship program really needs to meet what we call the four corners of a high quality program. That includes paid on the job learning, supervision of a field employee mentor, Second, that includes related classroom based instruction, often called related technical instruction or related supplementary instruction. That includes ongoing assessment against established skills and competency standards. Apprenticeships are not uh, programs that kind of make it up as they go. Apprentices have a very clear set of competencies they're trying to build towards mastery of. And finally, all apprenticeships need to culminate in a portable industry recognized credential. When we the word youth to the front of an apprenticeship word. What we are talking about is a program that is specifically designed to be accessible to someone before they graduate from high school. So a youth apprenticeship is not so much just an apprenticeship with a youth in it. It's a into the apprenticeship program. There are other norms that come along with that design that have to do with meeting the needs of population. One of the biggest ones that PIA defines youth apprenticeships not only as culminating in an industry recognized credential that could be, for example, be a journey person's card that one earns through a registered program, but it must also include post-secondary credit. This is a very important part for how you're dealing with young people early in their careers where the use of the apprenticeship is to not necessarily connect someone to a job for life, but to get them that important baseline work experience, industry credentials, as well as keep the option open for them to pursue further higher education. That is important when we think about program design for youth. Based on what we know about programs across the country, what we know about the prerequisites for most jobs that can offer mobility in our labor market today, and critically, through a lot of engagement that PIA has done through community, as well as focus groups with students and parents, that people are very excited and open to the idea of youth apprenticeship, even though they are new to most Americans, for their young, for their student, for their son, for their daughter. However, it has to be seen as a post-secondary option, as a way to and through post-secondary education, keeping that door open. It will not work if youth apprenticeship is an alternative. Next slide, please. In addition to this definition, that is why we had to create a set of guiding principles for what a high quality youth apprenticeship should look like in the United States. What you have here on this slide are our principles. I'll be providing a link at the end of my little talk right here that you can read about them in great detail. But very briefly, these five principles are meant to really be the aspirational direction for youth apprenticeships in the United States to realize both their promise for connecting young people to really solid job opportunities but at the same time, deliver and meet the needs of employers who are investing and sponsoring these programs. Youth apprenticeships need to be career oriented, meaning the learning is always structured around knowledge and skills associated with a job. It's important to know that just like a registered apprentice or an apprentice generally, an apprentice is an employee. Number and this is particularly important, I think, for the aims of a lot of the projects you're working on. 
youth apprenticeships have to be intentionally designed to be equitable. What we know, as Vince hit on quite clearly, is that really work experience, post-secondary credentials are the driving factors in one's determining future in terms of their labor market outcomes. We have research from that now that came out of child trends in Brookings that did a meta-analysis that what shapes labor market outcomes for youth is both a blend of work experience and post-secondary credentials and diplomas. So that means youth apprenticeships have to be designed intentionally to be equitable. It's not enough just to design a really high quality program and seek to diversify it. Programs have to recognize that the entry requirements to enter a program, any program prerequisites, whether that be GPAs or transportation, active supports and engaging employers to make sure they're, work, they're, they're able to successfully support young people who might have special needs or who might not look like a lot of their frontline workers, as well as setting equity as a goal in terms of the data and capability that's collected around apprenticeship programs. This is what it means to be designing programs intentionally, equitably, as opposed to just recruiting for diverse candidates. That's the difference between how youth apprenticeship could be a strategy for reigniting the connection between education and economic mobility versus just a very sound strategy for connecting people to work. Number three and four are linked principles and adaptable. The learning in an apprenticeship should be structured in a way that the one is earning post-secondary credits and learning that they can build on over the course of their apprenticeship experience and seek further higher education if they would like. Adaptable means that the skills and competencies one learns through a youth apprenticeship are not just tailored to meet the needs of a single employer, but rather an industry sector. For those of you interested or involved with the industry sector strategies, you can very directly see the importance of how you can work with multiple employers at once to design apprenticeship programs. This is probably only one of the realistic pathways to scale of these programs in the United States. And finally, youth apprenticeships should be accountable in the sense that both the student employer and program outcomes are actively monitored. That brings up one of the other core points I wanna drive home today. Next slide, please. Youth apprenticeship programs are a partnership. If you can look at the diversity of programs in the United States, you will find that there are three common players always involved in youth apprenticeship programs, and the programs demand, and in fact, sometimes can catalyze heavy levels of engagement and interaction across them. Industry is in critical to the apprenticeship program because they're hiring the apprentices. K-12 is critical youth apprenticeship programs because it's about connecting young people before they transition out of high schools. And third, secondary, going back to that portability point. In a lot of the related instruction that happens through youth apprenticeships across the country is by and large delivered by community and technical colleges. But that word about accountability is key. A youth apprenticeship intermediary, in this little graphic we have right here, which is an archetype simple triangle of how these partnerships work, the intermediary is critical for ensuring coordination across these three partners and a high quality experience. Youth apprenticeship intermediaries could be coming from any one of these players. And we have examples across the country of chambers of commerce or industry associations. We have examples of workforce boards. We have examples of community colleges. We have examples of school districts themselves playing key roles as youth apprenticeship intermediaries, as well as community-based organizations. So it's less about the who and more about the what and their capabilities and ability to coordinate these partners. Watching time. So if we go to the next slide, I want to just make a couple fire points before I hand over to show you how one of these partnerships actually works. Across the country, through the partnership to advance youth apprenticeship, we have mapped the landscape of existing youth apprenticeship programs. It's not exhaustive, but we have created a network for any youth apprenticeship program that wants to be a part of the learning, whether they're just starting a program, thinking about starting a program, or they've been running it for 20 years. So our grantees are a part of this network, as well as a broader community of interest. Next slide, please. Each one of these programs is working on a youth apprenticeship pathway, which here is an example of what one of these pathways looks like. I'm not going to describe it in detail, but it very clearly shows that there are norms about how these programs operate. Again, they look a lot like a early college type of program where someone is starting a new type of experience before they graduate high school, but they continue that experience after they graduate from high school and engage in the, both the college coursework and the paid on the job learning that allows them to culminate in multiple years of paid work experience, 
a network of professional mentors. They, of course, will get their high school diploma. We have examples of programs working with both comprehensive high schools, CTE skill centers, alternative high schools, and always these students as well are earning the post-secondary credentials and credit. Next slide, please. We have examples across the country of how youth apprenticeships fit a number of different industry sectors and occupational needs in advanced manufacturing, technology, financial services, business operations, healthcare, as well as education, both in the early care sector, as well as, as paraprofessional pre-teaching pre programs. It's important to note that although apprenticeship programs in the United States still tend to be heavily concentrated in the build, building and skilled trades, most youth, youth apprenticeships are actually not. Most youth apprenticeship programs tend to exist in what we would call these non-traditional sectors. Next slide, please. Two examples of partnerships that I won't review exhaustively, but you can read all about on the resources I'm about to share. We have examples in a, from some Carolina, where, for example, a technical college has served as the intermediary and operates two year competency based youth registered apprenticeships across now 13 different career pathways, working with over 80 employers throughout their region. The program has been up and running for about five years and shows the heavy level of coordination that, for example, a community college can help serve in bringing together employer K 12 and post secondary partners. As another example, that I won't review in great detail because there's plenty of information on the PIA website about it. Next slide, please. You've probably may have heard of CareerWise Colorado. It's a nonprofit organization that serves as the intermediary. Again, operating, working with a set of partners, K-12 post-secondary workforce. They work on five different youth apprenticeship pathways with several different occupations within each of them on a three-year youth apprenticeship model. They leave the decision to their employer, individual employer partners as to whether they want to register their apprentices or not, but provide very clear operational guidelines. For example, all youth apprentices earn 30 college credits. All programs generally are three years long, and they use standardized occupational pathways so that no employer is inventing the wheel as they go. Next slide, please. I'll wrap by saying that this was fast and I didn't mean to throw everything at you and I hope I'm sure you'll have questions later, but there's plenty of information on our website. You can see here both our landscape analysis research, read more about our definition and principles, as well as our profiles of different partnerships throughout the PIA network and new research publications that we've released over the past couple of years. So with that, I will hand back over to Jesse and we can save some time for questions at the end. Thanks so much, uh, Brent. I realize this is like uh, getting information on the pie of, from a fire hose. But as Brent mentioned, um, we do have um, a, a, the link in the chat as well to the PIA site. There is a wealth of information there. Also, we had a question come in about the slides. And yes, of course, we will make those available. So they will be posted following uh, this, this webinar. Um, before I turn it over to Debbie, I wanted to briefly also mention that we've been joined by Patrick Mannix, um, who is the ODEP Chief of Staff, uh, Office for Disability Employment Policy, which is the lead agency that is the sponsor of the AIM project. So I want to welcome you. Um, and all of you who are here today, um, we're going to go right into a, a, a site and hear more about a site that's been both practicing um, youth apprenticeship programs is a, is a, is a stalwart wart in the area of youth apprenticeship and inclusive apprenticeship. Uh, so um, those of you who were at the NOB conference a couple of years ago, you might have heard about the Shenandoah Valley and all the good things they're doing there. Behind all of those good things, most of those good things is Debbie Hopkins, who we have here today. And I want to turn it over to her to give us an in, some insight into um, what this looks like on the ground in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. So go ahead, Debbie. There are over 550 local workforce development boards in the United States. In Virginia, we have 15. The Shenandoah Valley Workforce Development Board serves 16 economic localities in rural Northwestern Virginia. As most of you know, local workforce boards receive formula-based funding from WIOA, and these funds serve youth, low-income adults and dislocated workers primarily. 
our local board has uh, historically pursued federal discretionary grants that are, let's say, less restrictive than WIOA funds and designed to uh, pilot innovations to address uh, regional workforce needs. So next slide. We were fortunate to be able to um, secure $4 million in the American Apprenticeship Initiative. Our initiative is called um, Valley to Virginia because we started in the Shenandoah Valley and then uh, expanded to all of Virginia. And we are one of the top three performing AEI grantees. We've worked with over 90 companies to create over, a, over 1,100 new registered apprentices in Virginia. And we've piloted a few workforce innovations that uh, impact youth, opportunity youth in particular, and individuals with disabilities. So our mission is to create inclusive pathways to careers, you know, not just jobs, and to put business in the driver's seat with workforce partners supporting their needs, a true sector partnership in action. So I'll take just a few minutes to highlight a few strategies uh, that we think have helped to promote inclusive apprenticeship in the Shenandoah Valley in both pre-apprenticeship as well as in apprenticeship. And in Virginia, in our program, uh, we are dealing ex exclusively with registered apprenticeship. So next slide. First, on uh, a word about partners. For any sort of sustainable workforce solution, uh, business really must lead and workforce partners must be must band together and have integrated solutions. Otherwise, they're, they're flash in the pan programs that really aren't sustainable. So for our initiative, uh, the key partners are education. And for us, that means K-12, vocational technical, community colleges, and private training partners. Uh, the local workforce board has extensive community partners, and many of those uh, worked with us on, on these particular initiatives. In our state, we, are, we have a state apprenticeship agency, and so the state apprenticeship agency has to be involved from the beginning uh, if you're going to have a good, um, you know, a good sustainable apprenticeship effort. And for our initiative, since we're targeting disability partners, the uh, or disability initiatives, the Virginia Department of Aging and Rehab Services and the Wilson Workforce Rehab um, Center, which is a vocational rehab center that serves the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, was absolutely a key partner, as well as another federal grant, the Career Pathways for Individuals with Disabilities grant um, that worked uh, closely with our um, uh, Virginia Manufacturers Association and DARS um, uh, to come up with with training for uh, vocational rehabilitation that uh, that really met the needs of entry manufacturing jobs. So the three strategies I'll talk about um, would be number one, connecting with high school youth apprenticeship. That is extremely important. I agree, I agree with everything that was um, uh, that was said previously by New America and the the PIA options. Having high school apprenticeship that is um, new types of um, occupations as well as uh, older types of occupations, let's say, is extremely important. That mindset of uh, working with businesses to get them to uh, extend their pipelines into high schools, to be able to have a solution that would create um, uh, career pathways for, you know, in and out of trade schools, in and out of college and so forth is very important. So Virginia's had a, a high school apprenticeship initiative uh, that is actually started with our state apprenticeship agency. Their assistant director is focused on, on youth apprenticeship and they've designed uh, on the job experiences that are very flexible, such as summer employment only uh, or part-time employment through the school year if the individual wanted it. So engaging with the schools, the businesses and um, other workforce and education partners to try to encourage high school apprenticeship and help show the pathways that that cannot lead to. The second one is uh, we develop a vocational pre-apprenticeship with the Wilson Workforce Rehab Center. So working with business and our disability partners uh, to create this pre-apprenticeship um, is a uh, really high quality pre-apprenticeship training that is a 16 week residential training includes industry credentials. It has the MSMT1, the Manufacturing Skills and Manufacturing Technician 1 apprenticeship. Uh, there's occupational exposure at local manufacturing sites. 
and a, a huge model um, on soft skills and employable skills. This was created um, by the Wilson Workforce Rehab Center staff with input from the, uh, you know, certainly from DARS and, and with uh, funding from the, uh, from the career path. Uh, and an extremely important part of that is the industry input. So it, business has to drive it. So the industry input to say what we need you know, not just credentials, but what do we need for soft skills and show me how that looks. So this program has, um, you know, ha is for entry manufacturing and it has uh, uh, both the soft skills and it has like a little production line set up and quite a bit of exposure to to business. And then thirdly, I'll touch on is a boot camp to apprenticeship. We worked with uh, one of our premier businesses in the, in the area, Hershey Chocolate, to develop an innovative free hire boot camp to employment and apprenticeship that um, I think still has some amazing uh, possibilities. We specifically targeted opportunity youth and individuals with disabilities. It's been very successful. Uh, you can put to the next slide. The uh, Hershey is a premier employer in the um, central Shenandoah Valley. They're located in Stewart's Draft, Virginia. Uh, this uh, in some of the presentations, I'll, I'll talk about uh, ET and how the uh, Reese's Pieces was a big part of creating uh, a, a major expansion in in the Hershey plant. You know, back in the 80s, I guess when that when that movie came out. So Hershey is uh, one of the most um, comprehensive or the most comprehensive manufacturing plant in the entire Hershey network. Uh, they do, um, they're building a roasting facility. They make um, many of the products that Hershey has. Um, and we are very proud to work with them because they have uh, continued Milton Hershey's, um, uh, I guess his mission in the very beginning of the company in, in 1909 in working with, um, with youth. Uh, there's, a, there's a no cost school uh, for underprivileged youth that continues to um, thrive today and a large trust that will keep that going. So this, this part of their culture is really engaged in the company and they were a great, a great company to work with to put together some of these programs that they can, we can then hopefully roll out to many other employers. So Hershey serves as an advisors in the Wilson Workforce Manufacturing Technician Training Program. Um, they regularly engage with K-12 local schools and in all ages. They were the first employer to apprentice a WWRC graduate. And they've also worked with us in our grant to create this novel boot camp to apprenticeship program. Um, so next flyer, next page, please. So you can see in this in the top left, there's a photo of the, the first boot camp. Uh, and the classes were held at the Wilson Workforce Center. Uh, there's um, an individual, you can see an interpreter there and some class activity happening. The first uh, pilot boot camp only had 11 students in that. Um, they are all registered apprentices today. We've had four addition, actually five additional boot camps since then. Our last one started, started last week. And not counting the last two, there are uh, 31 registered apprentices in that program. We learned a lot in that program, how to, uh, how to really engage with youth. You know, for instance, everything has to be by text. If you wanna reach youth, you need to give them a text. You don't expect your own children to uh, call you, you expect them to text you, and that's how you have to reach out to youth today. So we started with that. We spent a lot of time designing this camp to try to, um, try to figure out what Hershey needed, uh, what were the reasons people were succeeding and why they were failing and uh, what, you know, what could we do in this extended uh, hiring uh, process really to try to include some of the onboarding and the expectations. So the other photo in there is of uh, Marvin. He is uh, one of our, one of the students from the Wilson Workforce Manufacturing Technician Apprenticeship. Uh, he was also in the first boot camp. And he recently completed his registered apprenticeship program. So there's a, a celebration that's happening at Hershey um, to um, commemorate his uh, completion of his, of his program. He's also a student in uh, Blue Ridge Community College. He's uh, taking mechatronics and his goal is a next apprenticeship in mechatronics where he will um, uh, get a, uh, be a, an associate's degree from that. 
So it, it's a, an excellent example of how these are careers. These are not jobs. These are these are career focused for this. Uh, in the next slide, um, just let you know that this type of program that that we put together there has hit a nerve. It seems we've had presentations on this at, at several national conferences. Vince mentioned uh, mentioned uh, at the uh, in a WB conference last year. We've uh, presented with ODEP at a few conferences. Uh, also highlighted in VR Workforce Studio podcasts. Um, I'll show you a, a link to that in a second. And we've had uh, National Magazine, HR Magazine, Closing the Skills Gap, and also uh, two Virginia magazines. One is Virginia Business, and another one very recently was the Virginia Economic Review. And uh, from that, we've got quite a lot of interest with businesses and economic development to try to see just how, you know, how can similar things be put together to try to attract more people, particularly into manufacturing, and how to um, have these career paths and how to have it be more inclusive uh, so that, that individuals will have the, you have the outreach, you'll have the accommodations, you'll have the equity, all built in uh, and um, how can you make it sustainable? So next is a, a um, link to podcast stories. If you want to hear about vocational rehab stories that do include a number of people with apprenticeship, there's a link for that via our workforce studio. And then lastly, if we have time, uh, there is another success story with a, a young woman named Laura. Uh, she works at a company called Comsonics. Since this video was taken, she has uh, completed an industrial manufacturing technician apprenticeship, and she will very soon be registered for the next step, which is an electronics technician four year apprenticeship. Uh, and this, she was another Wilson workforce client, uh, you know, Dar's, uh, Dar's client, and who has been um, uh, very successful. So at the end, I'd be more than happy to give have any um, questions, answer any questions that anyone would have. Yes, and Debbie, we are going to continue to test the bounds of our technology today and uh, play this video. I just want to remind everybody that the slides and the links will be available. Um, so if if this doesn't work or if the audio quality uh, isn't uh, sufficient, you can definitely watch this later. I've watched it a few times; it's really terrific, and I encourage you to do that. So. Here we go. In June 2018, Laura Williams, a graduate of Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center's Manufacturing Technology Training Program, began her career with ComSonics, a company specializing in the design, manufacture, sales, and repair of electronics and fiber optics in Harrisonburg, Virginia. The program helped Laura gain the skills, training, and credentials needed for jobs in this high demand industry sector. I'm Laura Williams, and my position is mechanical assembler. When I was in the manufacturing program at WRC, people from Comsonics came to tour the classroom. We both got an idea of what was expected for me being in the program and for what they expected from their company. I think one of the things that maybe surprised a lot of us, uh, a lot of her coworkers, was that when Laura got here and was actually assigned to start doing work, she'd already demonstrated competency, been able to do some of the things we expected her. I got to tour the facility here. I really liked what I saw and the people I met here that worked here. When it came toward the end of my program, I called up Nate Mahanes, who is part of DARS, and he helped me get ready for the interview and what to kind of expect. People at Comsonics, when I met them, they were great. Um, they helped me feel, feel comfortable and was very willing to accommodate to any needs that I may have. They're very welcoming. With DARS, um, I had worked with Nate Mahane some through WWRC and had had the opportunity to obviously connect with DARS and um, start looking at applications and were very impressed with the qualifications that we were seeing from the folks that we were getting in. The first thing that stood out to me about Laura, she had two certifications, which told me she was very driven. Those two things obviously were huge uh, crossovers to what we do. And just being able to see that she was continuing um, to, to learn and to want to do more, obviously told us that she had the skill sets we were looking for. Plus she was looking for a career to build and was going to be able to grow with our company. I think they expected when she walked in the door, we were going to have to show her everything. She actually was, 
capable of providing value almost from the first day. We hire for abilities. And uh, the good news is we've hired some quality candidates through DARS over the years. And I will say one of the things that I've noted most is certainly the work ethic uh, in the candidates that we've interviewed and we've hired. I really liked what I saw and the people I met there that worked here. And I was, and I, at the end, I felt like this was, this is it. This is where I belong. In addition to her job at Comsonics, Laura also obtained her driver's license and moved into her own apartment near work, leading to full independence. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. That worked. Um, and I'm going to transition things back to Vince for some Q&A. And just again, uh, this whole presentation will be available for those of you who would like to watch it again later. Great, thanks, Jesse. And as, as she said, as Jesse said, we are pushing the boundaries here a little bit technologically. So if this was a little jerky, um, I posted the link to the video, the YouTube link in the chat. So you can also pick it up there and then watch it at your leisure. It is motivational and moving as is the work at the Shenandoah Valley. So uh, I appreciate, uh, Debbie, your uh, description of what you're up to in the Valley and how many uh, great things are going on. Not everyone has a chocolate factory in their area. Um, there's some special uh, draw to that, I'm sure. And also a real history in terms of their focus on uh, inclusive uh, apprenticeships and inclusive uh, tr job training, workforce, work-based learning. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So if you have questions of your own, please put them in the Q&A pod on the lower right-hand corner. Um, I'm gonna lead with one, uh, and that is a little bit of the elephant in the room <clears throat> that we are in the middle of a recession, unforeseeable, not there <laughs> six months ago, changed pretty much everything in the world of work. And I was just curious, um, maybe starting with you, Debbie, um, what your experience has been, how much you had to adapt, how you adapted to the new reality of, of uh, you know, a COVID-induced recession and how that's changed maybe the way you had to deal with employers, how you had to change your approach with, with participants and so forth. Could you talk to that a little bit? And get the audio to work. Are you there able you to hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Uh, yes, it has been quite a challenge uh, in this COVID environment. And the first challenge was with the suspension of uh, training for our active apprentices, both the youth apprentices in high school and also the adult vocational education and community colleges. Uh, many classes were just completely suspended while the education institute students um, figured out what they were going to do. Uh, in that period of time, while, while people were catching their breath, we already had training providers who were good virtual training like uh, NCCER and Tooling U. Uh, for trade apprenticeships who could help uh, help give substitutions for classes that would normally be offered at a community college, let's say. Uh, but pretty quickly, the, the, uh, the schools were starting to come back, at least with plans for the fall. So as many classes as can, as can be are online, uh, or if they have to be in person, they have already started to have about a third uh, to a half of the, the number of people in the, in the class at a time. So I, I feel like the, the education is uh, finding its way and there are plans. Uh, we have had very few apprenticeships that have uh, completely stopped at this point. We've had some furloughed individuals, but for the most part, manufacturing is what our focus is and that's the biggest sector in our area. Um, and they have been able to to come back with trials and tribulations, but they're able to come back. From a business standpoint, uh, we simply left our businesses alone for a few weeks and 
told them to contact us when they needed us or when they were ready because they had their hands full. Uh, we did as much training as we could to try to be aware of what was what the business requirements were, the the ever changing business requirements, uh, and then once um, once companies were were ready, what every company is that they you know we have we have state mandates to comply with. Um, so, for instance, at at Hershey, because I'm there a lot, uh, they change their shifts so that people come in on different different shift times and they don't pass each other. They take temperatures at the gate. If you don't, it's mandatory that you wear a mask. If you forgot one, that they'll give you one. Uh, no visitors on site, although I have been allowed to go on site as an exception for these apprenticeship completion ceremonies. Um, they were all done in a, an adjoining building, you know, in a distance environment. So one at a time instead of a group. Uh, that type of thing. We just finished our um, fourth and fifth Hershey boot camp and had to, you know, do quite a lot to figure out how we could, uh, you know, how we could uh, advertise to people that they could have their interviews virtually. That um, and assessments only, only every other space could be used, so we'd have more than six feet. You know, cleaning between each um, between each assessment, um, having uh, lots of face masks and. And um, uh, as part of the training there, we had to have it at a different place. We couldn't have it at Wilson because the normal classroom didn't hold the uh, quantity of people who who we needed, who Hershey wanted for this camp. So I, I think that um, it's been challenging, but uh, you know we're an innovative uh, an innovative area and business. I believe that you know businesses and education. Uh, in particular, um, they have to be innovative to survive in this, and they have been. And so we've done all we can to try to help, you know, help join their efforts to get back um, uh, to um, productivity. Thanks, uh, Debbie. That's that's great information to have, and I can see why it would be <clears throat> challenging. And the idea of leaving business alone to figure some things out for a period of time makes a lot of sense. Um, we are clearly running out of time here. Uh, it's obviously impossible to fit this topic into an hour, uh, but we are going to we we try it anyway. And this is really to whet the appetite. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, there's a lot of good resources. Um, we will make the slides available. And I'll turn it over back to Jesse to take us out of here. All right. Well, to your point, Vince, these upcoming webinars uh, are going to be actually 90 minutes. So I just wanted to let everybody know um, as part of our AIM work, we've been writing a series of research briefs on topics in inclusive apprenticeship, and we have three of them coming up over the next month. Um, so the first is uh, next is actually this Friday. It's on designing inclusive apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships, um, and um, we'll be talking about universal design and pre-apprenticeship. Uh, and then next week we have um, an exciting webinar on understanding the institutional funding sources that are part of apprenticeship system building. Um, and this is where, uh, first of all, I just want to remind everybody if it's an apprenticeship, your employer is your primary uh, funding partner, but that there's a lot of places to look to for institutional, uh, institutional funding and we'll talk about that. And then our last um, webinar will be in mid September and uh, sort of picking up on what Debbie uh, put down. Uh, we are going to be talking about lessons from resilient apprenticeship and pre apprenticeship programs. So, what happened with some of our programs after the pandemic? You can register for any and all of those webinars at our landing page, which is www.spra.com backslash aim. Um, again, this is all going to be available to you. So all these live links, you'll be getting those. Um, and then I would just have one ask of you, which is that as you close out this webinar today, as you hit the little X button, it's going to take you to a poll. If you can just give us a little bit of feedback, we always appreciate um, getting any feedback from folks. And um, we certainly hope to see you at one of these upcoming webinars. Thank you, thank you again to our terrific presenters. Thank you to our wonderful ODEP sponsors. A special thank you and uh, nod to Patrick Mannix and Jennifer Sheehy. We're, we're just delighted and honored that you were with us today. Um, and yes, hopefully we'll see you guys Friday. Thank you so much and have a terrific afternoon.